Good morning again. I will show you the steps for intubation for someone who has potential cervical spine injury and trauma. And the second skill that we're also going to do is a patient who has contaminated airway, possible blood or vomit in the airway. Uh, usually, uh, uh, pieces like this, uh, they have contaminated airway to the point that it's reactive airway. What that means is that blood or vomit is actively coming out, and you have to basically suction uh, a lot of these uh, patients continuously, right? Otherwise, you're not going to uh, decontaminate the airway. It's not like a scant amount of blood or a little bit, you know, vomit that's coming out. Think of it like a patient who, who just ate and had a trauma, right, or somebody in cardiac arrest that's uh, getting, you know, resuscitation and VLS pumped a lot of air in the stomach and now they're regurgitating and vomit, all these chunks are coming out. So it's, I know you guys are taught, right, you suction and, you, and then you have to ventilate every 15 seconds. This is not going to happen here. Why? Because if the airway is, uh, uh, keeps filling up, right, and even though you suction, right, the airway is still filling up and you're going to go with the BVM, where do you think you're pushing uh, all the stuff that's coming out? <coughs> where? No, stomach and where else? More the, the trachea. In the trachea, right? The glottic inlet, so it goes into the lungs, so you're basically causing possible pneumonia to the patient. So what I'm saying to you is that if I if I suction for 15 seconds, I didn't clear the airway, there's still vomit of blood coming through, right? And I go to 15 seconds to back to ventilation, I'm pushing all that contents back into the lungs, right? Yeah, some will go into the stomach, but you're not doing anything uh, beneficial for the patient, right? So we're going to go uh, through some of them. So the... Here they show you, right, the difficulty in the airway, and we're going to specifically talk about, right, the one with potential cervical spine injury, and then we're going to talk about blood and, or, or vomit. So the, the biggest problem with the ones with potential C-spine injury is that we cannot put the patient in the proper alignment with the ear hole to the sternal latch. We cannot raise the head like this, right, where the ear hole is to the sternal latch. Why can't we do that? You're you're gonna compromise the C-spine, right? So we don't wanna do it. So the head has to be lying flat. And the, what what the problem does that create? You're not aligned, so you won't be able to see the... Right, so when you go with your laryngoscope, you're not, you're not gonna have alignment with your oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes, right? So you will not be able to visualize optimally, right, the glottic inlet. That's so why you go with the bougie. Yeah, so, so we're gonna talk about, exactly, good. We're gonna talk about how we can overcome it. And the other thing is, right, we also got a a factor that is going to be somebody's going to hold manual inline stabilization we call it mills manual inline stabilization and the reason why that is important is that we need to open the collar for us to perform this procedure properly why because when i use my laryngoscope i have to displace the mandible right so the laryngoscope have i have to move the mandible forward right and up so that i can pass the tube if you have a rigid collar it's not going to let me move right the jaw, it's not going to let, let me displace the mandible. And the other important reason, if I want to pre this patient, I also cannot do a, a good jaw, jaw thrust, right? You see, right, if I open this up, right, then I, I'm able to get my fingers behind the ascending rami and I can displace the mandible. But with the original cervical collar in place, I'm unable to do so, right? So this is the reason why the cervical collar must come off. So what they say, right? So they also have possibility, right, of, of jaw displacement and trismus, right, in the trauma, especially with head and face injuries, right? And so, right, we have to position them properly. We have to provide manual inline stabilization. And for us to overcome it, we're going to do something known as ELM. ELM stands for external laryngeal manipulation. That basically means you're using your hand to manip manipulate, right, uh, the trachea so that it's aligned. And the other thing we're going to employ is a bougie we have here. This is called... The bougie, or another name, is an endotracheal tube introducer, right? Why is why is this beneficial? It guides you to where you want to go, and it gives you a clue as to where you are at exactly. Because if you're in the esophagus, it'll continue to descend. Yeah. So, so uh, the bougie, right? As you said, right? So you, you're not going to get an optimal view we just talked about because the head is going to be in line. So we're going to see a minimal view of uh, the vocal cords and maybe just the epiglottis, right? With, you know, so we have to use a bougie to basically uh, guide the tube. So how do you know you're in the right place as in you're in a tracheal inlet? You're going to feel resistance. You're going to have hold up. Usually hold up occurs at the right uh, main stem, right bronchi, and it will not let you advance forward. So hold up is the best indicator you're in the right, right spot. 
if it keeps advancing in the sense that you're bearing it in the stomach, right? That means that you are in the substance, right? So that's very important. So we use the bougie, right, to make sure we feel hold up your right, right main stem. Don't cause trauma by forcibly going like this, right? You stop, right? So that's what we're going to use for. So that's basically our procedure. We're going to open the collar, right? We're going to use the laryngoscope. We're going to use uh, this device. That's for somebody who has potential cervical spine injury. Now, if you have a lot of vomitus, right, and also a possibility of cervical spine injury, so they say the problems with this is that you have facial injuries, right, there is full stomach, or maybe BLS pumped in with air, right, and there's delayed gastric emptying, and their approach is they want to have two suctions, right, set up, so we have two suctions set up, and what they say here, right, uh, is you need to have a large bore suction. And I'll show you the difference what I mean by collar large bore and regular. So these are, what are these called? The yeah. French catheter. Yank hour. Yeah. Right? What's the purpose of them? French catheter. Well, why were they created? Anybody knows? They're for the suction. They're some, for, what, for what procedure? Sorry. No. For sure, what procedure? Different dental procedures. Well, <laughs> tonsillectomy, right? When they remove the tonsils. You see the, like the, the opening here is very small, right? It will, if you have chunks and vomit and blood, right, and it's a blood uh, that's coming out, it may congeal, it may clot, right? So you may have blood clots, you may have chunks in the stomach. This is a very small opening. It will not decontaminate the oral pharynx. So what they adv advocate, this is called the ducanthal catheter. You see the, the, it's large bore, right? So the opening here is bigger. So it can evacuate much bigger uh, contents from the stomach, right? So these will not be as effective, right? That's if I was, thing. if I didn't have this, I'll probably just cut down the tube, right? I'll cut down the plastic tube. Right? I'll just cut down the plastic tube. But these will not decontaminate the airway, right? So now let me show you some of the pictures so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So here they show you MILS. MILS stands for manual inline stabilization. So in picture A, she's showing the wrong technique. She's actually yeah. holding the mandible, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if she's holding the mandible, you cannot move it, right, when they actually perform the laryngoscopy procedure. But here they say ear muff approach, so she's holding the ears. This person's job is to make sure the head doesn't lift up of the stretcher or whatever the patient's on, maybe a long board. And you notice the collar is still in, still in place, right, they just open it. Why is the collar still there? You want to put it back on. You want to put it back on after you completed the procedure, right? So, very good. So, here, the, again, just a close-up view, right? Uh, don't hold the mandible. You hold the mandible, there's no displacement. You will not be able to integrate. This basically, they, if, if your partner is doing this, they're creating more problems for you. So you want to emphasize, hold the ears. I want the jaw to be mobile, right? Uh, so here is the correct technique, right? So you see how he opened the mouth, so the jaw is mobile at this uh, uh, station, right? So here, they tell you basically, when the patient is flat, right, supine, without ear to the sternal notch position, right, they say the view, right, with DL, DL stands for direct, direct laryngoscopy. That's when we use, right, our eyesight to basically look in the mouth with the mag blade. They say manual inline stabilization mills worsens the view by 50% of the cases, right? So 50% of the time you're not going to see a good view, right? And in addition to, right, uh, if you also holding the mandible, you're not going to get the displacement. So you, mm -hmm. you must make sure, right, the mills is done with the earmuff approach. So the head doesn't look right. This is the major thing here, right? And the other thing, right? They say uh, they advocate, right, uh, to use in some studies to use video laryngoscopy. You guys remember if you went to the similar lab, I showed you the video laryng laryngoscope. This was a hyperangulated blade, and um, the technique is slightly different. You you actually want to see like a 50% view to actually advance the tooth. Because if you have a 100% view, you're not going to be able to advance the tooth. But more importantly, when they look at the studies, what they said is this, right? Uh, it's less likely that there's the right device, but for the unstable C-spine, it's more important that the right experienced practitioner uh, and is using the device with he or she is most comfortable. So what does that mean to you? Um, so, yeah. Use your, I forgot what the glass was. So, so, let me, so let me put it this way, right? Let's say, let's say I've been I've been working. Let's just say let's say I've been working as a paramedic for three years. Let's just say, right? I've been using mag blade number four or number three majority of the time for pretty much all my intubations, cardiac arrest, right, and all so forth. All of a sudden, trauma intubation, right? I, I have somebody who has trauma, right? Potential cervical spine injury, and now I got to intubate them. Should I all of a sudden go to my 
uh, airway kit and take out a middle blade that I never used in my life and try to intubate this person. Use what makes you more comfortable. Exactly. You use the blade you're most proficient in, right? There's no right blade, right? And the studies show that it's it's the experienced provider utilizing the equipment they're most familiar with. It's the same way if I never used the video laryngoscope, right? I would never grab it uh, knowing that I don't know how it works. I never used it before. I'm much more comfortable with, let's say, my three or four. I've done it. I've done many intubations with it, and I'm more proficient with it. So I'll go with the device I'm most proficient, right? You're never going to employ something you never employ. It's the same thing like if you play any sports and then you're going to go to com to compete, would you wear equipment or uh, gear or something you never used in training or ever before? It would be, you, you wouldn't, right? Uh, because you don't know how it functions. So it's the same thing here, right? Uh, so employ the device you're most comfortable with, right? And the studies actually show, right, there's no best device. Use the one that you're most proficient in. If, for example, if you are the most proficient with Miller and you've been using it the entire time, stick with that. If you're most uh, comfortable using a Mac, stick with the Mac, right? If your service, for example, bought a video laryngoscope and you've been using it for all your intubations, stick with that, right? Uh, the techniques with the video is different. So I have a video for that, right? You actually want a full review, right? Uh, for that device. Right, and here's uh, so they the, here's the hallmark points for patient who have uh, unstable C spine. So they say uh, we're not going to worry about the first one. We don't have any imaging in the ambulance, so we're not going to do that. Right. So we say the provider should be optim optimally used in patient device he or she is most experienced with. Right. So like I just said, mag blade if you're most uh, experienced with it, or miller blade depending on your situation. Next thing, right? Uh, you're going to be prepared for poor view with the life of laryngoscopy. Right. Why do you have poor view? Because the patient is flat. We can't put the ear hole to the sternal notch. So how we overcome that? We overcome that using a bougie and ELM, external laryngeal manipulation. It's basically moving the trachea in a position where you see the optimal view. Right, that's number, number three, right? This is very important. I want you to read this and like write this down so that it's ingrained in your mind. Rigid cervical collars must be open or removed and replaced with properly applied manual inline stabilization. Are we gonna ever intubate somebody with a C collar on with a Miller blade number four? No, because because usually, right, from my experience in the paramedic programs, that's how the technique is uh, demonstrated. They'll put a C collar on the patient uh, on the on the mannequin. They'll say, "Well, you can't remove it once it's on, and you got to use a Mac four, right? Because that's trauma, right? And that's that's their explanation, right? But that that tells me a they never done this in real life because the moment you you do that, it's not going to work. And two, n nobody reviews the literature, right? So I want you to pay attention to this point, right? Uh, the mills, when you do it properly, right, you want to make sure you don't immobilize the mandible, so you don't hold the mandible in position, right? And here, the hyperangulated blade, that's the video laryngoscope I was showing you, glidoscope in the sim lab, right? You want to actually, you want to have a deliberate uh, bad view, a restricted view, 50% view, so that uh, your endotracheal tube advances easily. So if you have 100% view on the video, you're not going to be able to advance the tube, but if you reduce your angle, then it's easy to advance, right? Um, Right, so these are the major points for, for the C-spine, right? Now, the next one we're going to talk about is the vomit and the blood. So here they say why it's so difficult is because, right, you have a patient and trauma, right, and you have a combination. They have AMS, or altered level of consciousness. They have diminished protective airway reflexes. They have delayed gastric emptying and probably, right, BLS pump a lot of air already. They have full stomach because if you sustain trauma, the guy may just ate and now he's driving a car somewhere, right? You don't know, right? Uh, and the high risk of vomiting, the high risk of aspiration, so that we need to control the airway. They also say, right, the management of contaminated airway must begin with expectation that the blood that's coming out is a small amount of what you're going to see. So if you see some blood and vomit, expect to, for more to come, way more to come, right? So this is very important to know. Right? You want to make sure you have adequate suction available. You want to make sure you have two canisters because they fill up quickly. So if you're... If, you know, you're working with good BLS, hopefully they brought theirs. But as ALS providers, you always take your suction. I know it's heavy, right? But you always bring it with you. Why? Because what if BLS didn't bring it? You got nothing, right? You got you got contaminated airway and you got no suction. And the other thing, what you can do is if you work for a service where you have a good medical director or somebody who is in logistics, you could say, hey, listen, uh, can you order these wide bore suction catheters, right? They're not much more expensive, right? It, but for the EMS providers, there's really no need to have this yank out that's for tonsillectomy. No need at all. You really need a, a wide bore because most times we're doing it, we're not there, you know, for, you know, minor stuff. We're there, guys, 
in cardiac arrest, full stomach, guys in trauma, right? Vomit, blood is coming out. Maybe they have esophageal varices that bursted, right? We gotta take, we gotta decontaminate a lot. So that's why it's very important to have that. And you wanna have two, right, units in case one is filled up, right? Here they say uh, you wanna be cognizant when you pre-oxygenate them, right? You wanna avoid 20 centimeters of water pressure. What that basically means is that when you squeeze in the back, you wanna be careful that you're not exceeding the 20. You're not gonna be able to see if you don't have a manometer. But the reason why they use this number is because the moment you exceed 20, you overcome pressure at the upper, upper esophageal sphincter and you're entraining air into the stomach. So you want to be cognizant that, that you're not doing these types of ventilations, right? Just enough that you see adequate chest rise. You know what else helps you to not entrain air into the stomach? Very important. What else will help you to make sure the air goes to the original inlet mostly? Your cathography. Not your cathography. Uh, aligning, uh, adjusting the airway. How? Um, by your head, your jaw thrust, excellent, right? So remember, I was showing you the triple airway maneuver, right? I'm just uh, so you can see, right? So the triple airway maneuver, you cannot do in trauma, right? Why? Because the triple airway maneuver, let me just move this collar out of the way. The triple airway maneuver was lifting the mandible, opening the mouth, and extending the head. You can't do this in trauma. <coughs> All we can do is just lift the mandible up forward, right, to the ceiling, and when you do this. The junior glossus muscle of the tongue is directly connected to the mandible. So when you move the tongue out of the airway, right, this is when you could actually ventilate them properly. Your entitled CO2 will definitely show you minute-to-minute -minute ventilation, but even sometimes you may have poor, right, head uh, management. You will still see some entitled CO2 when you ventilate them, but make sure you practice doing optimal jaw thrust, right, and then patients who don't have a uh, cervical spine injury do the triple airway maneuver, right? That's the best thing you can do. And then you definitely use your adjuncts. By the way, what's the purpose of the OPA? To hold the tongue in place. No. To uh, stop the mouth from closing. Exactly, right? It's to not allow the operator from yeah. closing the mouth. Right? Excellent, right? Right? I have a question. Yeah. If you have a patient, let's say, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for you. If you have a patient who has, like, um, throat and, um, and neck cancer, and they're, like, been like went through reconstruction and everything, should you just go right away to the bougie? You yeah, know so, be hard? so they actually did a study, uh, they published a thing in JAMA, and they, they basically looked at first pass success. First pass means they get the tube on the first try. And what they did was for all their uh, patients who came in, regardless if they thought it was difficult airway, easy airway, it doesn't matter, they said they used the bougie the first time, right, mm -hmm. regardless. And they almost had like 99% success rate, right, mm -hmm. for all their patients, as opposed to going second try with, with the bougie, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it decreased dramatically. So yeah, if you have the bougie and you have the capability, use the bougie the first time for every patient. It builds the dexterity, and also if you happen to encounter a difficult airway, you already have the bougie in place. Mm -hmm. So you're not, uh, you know, thinking about it. They also showed that, you know, they, they give some uh, rules like 332, 332, lemon, and all these other mnemonics for you to, like, what to do if it's a difficult airway. And in studies, they showed they're not effective, meaning, you can you can't really predict until you you're actually visualizing. You don't know you know what you're going to see until you actually visualize and you go inside. Mm -hmm. So have the bougie ready, I'll say. Yeah. yeah. So when you're setting up, you're it's best to have the bougie ready. Yeah, absolutely. Regardless. Yeah, have the bougie ready. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So and so here they say two two uh, suction units laryngoscopy. I'm going to show you a method uh, when we do the scale. It's basically uh, I'm going to use a laryngos uh, laryngoscope to instrument the airway. But I'm going to use the rigid suction, right, to basically suction until uh, until I see the epiglottis, see the blade in the molecular. Then I'm going to move it uh, to the side of my blade, to the left-hand side of the blade, and I'm going to, like, park it in the esophagus. I'm going to let it stay in the esophagus for continuous suctioning, right? So one of my uh, suction is going to be in the stomach the entire time as I'm intubating. Why? Because as the blood, vomit, whatever is coming out through the GI tract, it's consistently suctioning. And I'm going to have a second unit nearby. Why do I need a second unit? In case there's enough to block my view, to obstruct my view for the epiglottis, right? So I'm going to need a second one to basically suction through. And then once I put my tube in, I secure the tube that I'm not really worried about, right? I can remove everything, confirm. And yes, if some blood vomit went into the uh, lungs, you may need to do inline sterile suctioning. And we showed you, right, how to do it. You basically take a soft suction catheter, you pass it through the endotracheal tube, mm -hmm. right? All right, so this is the this is the major points, right? They say you want to use an encounter catheter. This is one of the doctors named after him, right? The catheter. It's a rigid large bore catheter, right? To decontaminate the airway. 
right, then you want to basically perform laryngoscopy, keeping the blade superior. So I'll show you how that looks. You're going to press the suction tip into the upper esophagus. So basically, we're going to put this in the esophagus and wedge it there. Why? So it can consistently suction, right? We're going to need a second unit in case, right, it's still contaminated. So I want to clear it to the uh, epiglottis. This uh, is basically rotate your blade so that you could advance the tube easily. And then place the endotracheal tube and place the cuff. So we're going to confirm the positioning, right? So, and the all the management pearls, right, just as I said, Two large bore the counter catheters, right? You want to consider alternate options, but in this case, you're not going to have much of these stuff, right? You don't have sutures or anything like this. Positive pressure ventilation, you want to be careful when you pre oxygenate them. Why? Because aggressive and poor uh, jaw thrust will entrain air into the stomach, right? Uh, you want to look for the epiglottis, that, that's our landmark. That's why I tell you when you intubate, don't over uh, shoot, don't just insert the blade blindly. You're going to overshoot your landmark. So we go for that landmark, right? Uh, you know, they say video laryngoscopy is considered best, however, right, I would say use the device you're most comfortable. They also say the video laryngoscopy may have a problem, right, because the blood vomit may obstruct the optics. The video camera may be obstructed, so you you cannot be seeing much, right? So we're going to use direct, direct laryngoscopy here. Here they say you may consider using an tracheal tube for, for diversion that basically says you may put a uh, and the tracheal tube in the esophagus connected to suction to decontaminate the stomach, but we already have this, so we're not going to do this. Uh, so we, this is this is the specific mannequin. This is called the salad mannequin. Salad mannequin stands for suction assisted laryngoscopy airway decontamination. I specifically asked for this to be ordered so you guys can practice, right? Um, and then, right, uh, if the patient uh, fails intubation, right, they're going to do what's known as fauna, 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 neck airway. Right, basically, in the hospital, they'll cut, right, the surgical trike. You guys are unable to do so. You can even put a needle trike for this patient. So my advice to you is get proficient in good suctioning, right, and all that stuff, right? Uh, so that's the main thing here, right? This is the, just to show you, right, the difference. This is the decalter catheter. Uh, you see the difference between regular and the large bore, right? So this is the one that I'm going to show you. This is the tonsillectomy one. Right, and just give you some examples. Some of them have a opening, uh, and, and the, the real ones don't have the opening. And I actually don't don't like having the opening. The opening is you put a, a closure here to start suctioning. I don't want that opening. I want it to suction consistently. Because when I park it, I want to let it go of it, and it continuously suctions. That's why this one I take over. I take over the <laughs> suction port so that uh, right, it doesn't uh, stop the suction. Right? And so just to make sure, right, the indications are still the same, right? Why we're going to intubate, failure of airway maintenance or protection, failure to ventilate, oxygenate, and clinical courses to decline. Those are the reasons why you intubate, right? And we're going to stick with these uh, indications. This goes for trauma and your medical, right? And some tips I want to show you, right? Usually when we put the endotracheal tube, we have a, a rigid stylet, and we make it like into a hockey stick position. But with the bougie, can we do this? No. No, because the tube has to go over the bougie, right? So this is uh, some tips that I want to show you, right? As you pass that, and the tracheal tube, actually, let me get a tube so you guys can see. When you, when you pass that, and the tracheal tube, right? You see how this bubble, you see this bubble? See the bubble of the tube, like this bubble? The tendency of it is to get caught, caught like this on the vocal cords, right? So what you do is you're going to, if that happens and you meet resistance, sure. you pull back, you rotate counterclockwise. See how, how they show in the picture? And then you're going to advance it forward, right? So what they're saying basically is you're advancing the tube like this. This part is getting caught. You pull back, you rotate it, and then you have ease of advancement. Right? So this is the different types of bougies that they have, right? So bougie goes... This is the type of view. You see how, how the view is shown here? You see how it's a poor view? All you see is the epiglottis. So you meet, you feel hold up, right, once the two, uh, once the bougie is advanced. And then right here on picture A, right, it shows you resistance. You pull back, you rotate, and then you have ease of advancement. You confirm all your metrics, right, and then we do the securing of the device. So I'm going to show you real quickly, right, how it looks. I'm going to turn off the... Projector, so you guys can come over here. You see, come over here. Hi.
Hi, Kayla. Hi, Lamont. Hi, Priscilla. Teach these ladies how to behave. Say hi, guys. Oh my God. So let me show you first the mannequin so you guys are familiar with all the functions, right? Definitely, you're going to wear gloves. I have some, uh, uh, sorry, I have some uh, contaminant of blood, and it will stick in your fingers if you don't use gloves, right? But uh, for this procedure, if you're doing it in the field, you're obviously going to wear your whole setup, right? Face protection, eye protection, and so forth, right? And uh, this mannequin, right, as I said, this is called salad mannequin, suction assisted laryngoscopy airway decontamination. And just to show you, right? So the lungs are housed in the case. I'm gonna put the collar back on him. And the reason why it's housed in the case is because once the fluid is flowing, it's gonna fill up the lungs, right? And so uh, I'm gonna show you, right? Uh, there I put my PVM. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Right. So as you see, right, this is a bad technique. I'm going to show you, right. Don't do this technique. But you see how the lungs are inflating, right? So these outlets go to these lungs. They will fill up with, with blood. This, the esophagus goes to this tube. So once we basically uh, utilize this pump, it's going to contaminate the airway, right? So you see, right. So as you see, right. Bad technique, can't really ventilate, can't do anything. So what you really need to do is, uh, we're gonna do mills, I'll show you how that looks, right? And for that, the airway needs to come open and actually have you come to the side. So I'm gonna open the airway, right? I don't know if you will be have enough room, right? To to grab, right? Yeah, so he's, he's standing here. I'm, I'm just showing you for this demo purpose. I know it's uncomfortable uh, uh, to do so, right? And the reason why he has to do this is that the jaw has to be mobile. Everybody see that? Now, if the patient did not have any airway contaminants, right, we put him on a pulse ox, and let's say he was desaturating, right, he had poor, poor saturation, right, I would always tell you, disconnect the mask of the BVM, right, you're going to open your cuffs, you're going to put, right, it on the mouth and nose, and then you're going to basically, right, I, I don't need him to do this anymore because I'm at the head and I'm gonna lift the jaw every time the breath is delivered, right? So if, if I'll give you the mask, right? I'll tell you squeeze on six, and I'm gonna engage on five. So two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, six, right? Two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, six. So he's gonna do that. Now, imagine we have a different situation, right? We have a patient who has now contaminated airway. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this to kind of like refill Come over here. See? Yeah, you see the, the you, I don't know if you guys can see. See the blood in the airway? Yeah. Now imagine, right, this is, as you are suctioning, it keeps coming out, right? As you're suctioning, it keeps coming out. So how are we going to remedy the situation? We have to basically do uh, suctioning. Oh, you got the, the light? <laughs> I have a better flashlight. Yeah? I'm going to use, I, I will just show you with the learning scope. Look. We see it. All we right. See it. So, so now, right, the airway is contaminated. Actually, let me have you. You're gonna come over here. You're gonna when I tell you, you're gonna basically continue retraining air uh, and uh, blood in there, right? So what we're gonna do is we have our suction, right? So I already connected a ducanto catheter here, and then on this one, right? Let me connect another one. So, on the tape it. Yeah, that's good. So what he's gonna do is gonna tape the opening here, right? Uh, and then actually, let me grab the this thing so you guys can see I think in the mouth. Otherwise, you won't be able. Do you want my flashlight? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Actually, come over here. You stay with him. I think it might actually work, look fine. We're working together now. Yeah. Future, par Christina. future partner. <laughs> I will bang out. You will bang out. Right, Come bang out. Yeah. That's bright. Wow. Yeah, that is very bright. Uh -huh. <laughs> Short people gotta come to the front. Right? <laughs> All right. 
So come, maybe come over here, right? So what you're gonna do is, right? So we wanna lead with the laryngoscope and you could go ahead and start pumping. So we do cross finger technique and I start suctioning, right? Slow down a little bit, slow down, right? So now I, I, I clean a little bit and what I'm gonna do is I need to introduce, I need to find my epiglottis, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start inching on the tongue and I'm clearing. I am clearing, right, to the epiglottis. I see the epiglottis, I'm gonna sit my blade in the volecula. So I sit my blade in the volecula, and what I do with this, and you can keep pumping, right? I'm then remove this, and I'm gonna park it in behind my uh, blade, and I'm gonna move it all the way to the esophagus, esophageal space. Right, so you see the laryngeal inlet, it's not a good view, right? So now I gotta use the bougie. And so we're gonna come in with the bougie, and how do I know I am in the right place? I feel hold up. Don't remove your blade. Your blade stays in place, and then my partner is gonna lace the tube over. Yeah, make sure you don't break, you don't grab the cuff, you grab it here, and then my partner is gonna take the top. Now, remember I told, I, I have resistance. What I do, pull back, rotate. How far down I go, this was at 8.5. How much? Yeah. Yeah, so I have 24 and 25 at the lip line, right? So now what I do is this, right? I hold this, yeah, pardon, inflate the cuff. I still have my blade there because I want to make sure it's in the right place. We're going to remove this, right? And then my partner is going to connect BVM with entitled CO2. And we, with the entitled CO2, and we're going to confirm, right, that we see good chest rise. Right? So now we're gonna confirm, right, that we have positive what? Entitled CO2? Mm -hmm. What else? Condensation. No condensation. <laughs> Long sounds. Long sounds. Right and left, what else? Yeah. SpO2, right? So those are the key markers, right? You see how the lungs are inflating? So now that I know that I have good confirmation, I'm gonna take this out, right? And then what I'm gonna do is, I don't need my suction anymore, right? So I can remove it. If I needed to suction when this was in place, and it was coming up, I could have used my second one, right? So do me a favor, right? Uh, pump up the... Yeah, go ahead. So if I needed to, I could use a second one to suction, right? So now I have double of, the, of, of, of them, right? Yeah, you could stop, that's fine, right? So if one fills up fully, you could put it to the side, thank you. Right, and you could turn them off, right? So now, we decontaminate the airway. Now, what happens if I, I secure the tube, but now blood and vomit is coming out? Should I be worried? No. I'm not worried because I have now secured my airway, right? Mm -hmm. I can continue suctioning, but one important thing I told you about, right? Remember this device? And I said, you must go down like this, mm -hmm. not up, down, not upside down. How right. come? So if it, if one comes out, it yeah, can if drain. It comes out, it'll go. Yeah, so if I put the bite block, right? And you guys are gonna see, you see? If I put it the right way, the mandible is mobile. I could still, Put a rigid suction in here. If I put it incorrectly and I put it like this, right? Yeah, it's still going to serve as a bite block. But can I move my mandible? I can't really put anything there. So that's the that's why I keep telling you guys when you're placing this device, you want to make sure, right, that this is placed so that the ink hour can come in, right? So like this, so that we secure our. You can squeeze. See yeah, how the lungs getting inflated? And so this case has to stay open, right, when we're doing this. Why? So we can see, right, if you got good placement. If I close the case, I don't know if you're in the right place. So Velcro is first, you noticed, right? Velcro is first, and this is the last thing to do. Why Why is the bolt last thing? Yeah, I could move if I if I... If I do this first and then I start manipulating the Velcro, I, there's a potential of dislodgement, usually not, right? Uh, so once we do this, we reconfirm, and then once we reconfirm, we're gonna get our rig rigid cervical collar in place, right? So rigid cervical collar goes in place. Again, we confirm entitled CO2, which is obje objective data, lung sounds, left and right, mid-auxiliary, SpO2. No condensation, no misting, none of that nonsense, right? You see anything coming through the endotracheal tube, blood, vomit, right? Uh, 
you suction, right? There's one thing, else, something else I want to say. What if it goes so far up that the BVM gets contaminated? Are we going to throw it away? Switch. No, what you do is this. You remove this part, you unscrew this up, off, and then you clear your contaminant, right? So vomit, you clear it, mm -hmm. and then you rescrew it, right? I don't want to waste, I don't want to waste a lot of BVMs to do this. Hospital base for it, it's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, but you want to be cognizant, right? What if you need another one for another patient, right? And so, right? So you take this off, just so we're, just so we're clear, right? Uh, what is this port for? That's for... Um, Medication. Medications, medication. right? And uh, we yeah. used to give in cardiac arrest uh, medications through the tracheal tube. We no longer do it for adults. And uh, uh, pediatrics still has it, has it there. And what is this port for? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? You see how it's connected to the reservoir, right? And there's something else that gets connected here. Anybody know? Yeah. The, the P valve. And what is the purpose of that? To keep that light open. Exactly, right? So if you have those patients, like let's say you want to intubate, they have congestive heart failure, right? Okay. You, you start to pre them, pulse act is still low, 89, 90, right? You connect the P valve, start at five, maybe 10, and then you do that at another two minutes, and then you'll get the setup, right? So the hallmark of this, what we're gonna do is you're gonna use a large bore suction, clear the, the <coughs> contaminant, find up a glottis, use the bougie, right? Put the tube in, confirm, right? And then uh, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna uh, watch you. One, one thing I wanna say, when these canisters get filled, you see how this one is uh, pretty full. Mm -hmm. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take it to the sink and we're gonna go and refill this back up. All right, you guys have any questions? No, everything's clear? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. <laughs>